So without further ado, I think we got Patrick Bonnet right here, and again, he's with the Douglas County Republican Party, their executive director. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you today, and it's good to be here to represent the Douglas County Republican Party. As many of you know, I too was organizing on a grassroots level over the last 10 years or so. And I thought today I'd just come out and share a couple of pieces of history so that you maybe would have a story to identify with. It wasn't too long ago that as a financial advisor I was teaching my clients to appeal property tax valuations. I started that in 2001 and continued until about uh, 2008 and uh, once I saw the way the uh, election cycles were going kind of the direction we were taking as a country, I decided to step up my game. What a great ride it's been. <clears throat> I have made so many wonderful new friends and uh, collaborated with so many great associates. I've really found a new source of pride. The Douglas County Republican Party, you know, I was, this past weekend I was trying to figure out what I was going to share with you about the, about the Republican Party and the conservative mo movement all together. So I was sitting in church, go to St. John Vianney, and my pastor told the story of the Babylonian captivity. And I started thinking that, uh, you know, as they say, history really repeats itself. Even as far back as the Israelis, uh, Israelites' term in, in Babylon. And there's a lot of similarities there and a lot of lessons that we as activists and concerned citizens can take from that story. And as you're out there uh, working your daily life, your jobs, we all sometimes fall into that trap, that Babylonian prison. Whether you have a dead-end job that you're just maybe not happy with or, or a difficult marriage, difficult relationship, money troubles, or maybe you're facing an an addiction. There's a problem there, and it's that Babylonian captivity. We're all in that at one point in our lives or another. And while I was sitting in mass, I started thinking that, you know, history does repeat itself, and we're seeing that same Babylonian captivity all over again. And there's a certain segment of our country that's stuck in their own little Babylonian captivity with debt and spending and bad habits and self-destructive behavior. We're seeing a lot of that coming out of the left these days. And you know, I've heard that lesson before. And I think with the Douglas County Republican Party, that it too has been there. Disorganized, undermanned, underfunded, it's stuck. And that's why I decided to get involved and I hope you too will make that decision to help out, get involved in one group or another, and preferably your political party, because we need help. I scratched my head a couple years and I, ago and I went in to volunteer and I was asking Jeff Kanger at the time who was running the office, said, why are we so weak? Uh, looking at the uh, ballot, there's 16 or 17 offices we didn't have a, a candidate to, to run for. And he said, we're undermanned, we're underfunded, and thanks for coming in. <laughs> I got the point. The point was I hadn't stepped up previously. And that's what it takes for each of us to step up and make a little bit of difference. And if we all do that together, we'll bring our parties forward, we'll bring the country forward. I don't get too biblical that, that often, but I like that story of the Babylonian captivity. And there's another story that I like to, to relate. When I look around at my own involvement, you know, I, I get charged by finding somebody else out there to use as an example. Maybe you do the same thing. Maybe when you're in the gym, you look around at somebody who's really getting after it, kind of gives you a little inspiration to stay the, stay the course and, and knock it out yourself. Well, in politics, you look around for a little inspiration, somebody who believes as you do, who uh, inspires you to step forward and find your political voice. And over the last couple of years out there organizing, I found a few folks like that. And the next guest who's going to come up here and speak to you today is just one such person. 
I had the opportunity to inter introduce him before. And uh, he was a little embarrassed at the time, but I looked back at the Bible to help me uh, source a nice introduction for him. And sometimes when you're out there and you're struggling, you're working hard, it just seems like you have the deck stacked against you. It's a big 800-pound gorilla pounding you down just when you're trying to do some good. Well, the way I see it, the left has their 800-pound gorillas, and we need our own. We need our own champion to stay in the fight, inspire the troops, and bring out good folks to step forward and, and make a difference. So I look to David and Goliath. Great story. A young shepherd boy stepped forward, saw his countrymen down in the mouth, uh, uninspired and fearful. And many of them were afraid to step forward and get into the fight. Well, our local champion here saw that some work needed to be done and somebody needed to step forward and get in the fight. And I'm going to bring forward David Nabity, our own David versus Goliath. He's our champion that stepped forward, got into the fight, saw what needed to be done, and put himself out there. So Dave, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. Michael's all yours. Are, are you going to be uh, my faithful assistant? I will. Okay. He's going to play the role of Vanna up here while I, I talk. Thanks so much for hanging around and uh, waiting for me to come out, or maybe you're waiting for somebody else and you're just stuck here, but I'm glad you're here nonetheless. I'm Dave Nabity. I run a group called the Omaha Alliance for the Private Sector. Have you ever heard of us? Well, we got started when we were looking at the budget of Omaha being so out of whack, and we kept hearing about this fire department in the city of Omaha that was $5 million over budget, and we were beginning to wonder what the heck was going on, and then people started talking about raising taxes to fund pensions and all those sorts of things. So a group of us got together, and we thought, you know, we're going to start doing some research. We're going to start looking at the labor contracts of the city of Omaha and just get a feel for whether our labor contracts are fair, whether they're competitive. You know, why are we so over budget? Why do we have to raise things like restaurant taxes and things like that to cover the cost of our labor contracts? So we did a few things. We got our hands on a bunch of labor contracts. And much to the, to the dismay of my wife, I spent a lot of time reading labor contracts. We went to cities like Colorado Springs, Des Moines, oh my gosh, Denver, Colorado, Wichita, all of these are pretty much Midwestern cities. This was the 2007 labor contract for the city of Omaha. This is Madison, Wisconsin. Now, if you saw the size difference in these two contracts, what would go through your mind? There's something buried in those details that's made that contract so thick. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't you say that? If you were a businessman and they said, look, okay, we got it all down in a contract. Here, sign this one or sign this one. Which one would you rather sign? Well, so we started doing research and looking through all these contracts, and we found that this contract had language in it that none of the others had. Language that said that you had to have and hire 657 firefighters whether you need it or not. You had to have a whole list of equipment in service whether you needed it or not. And we couldn't find another city in America that mandated equipment and staffing in the labor contract. So what that basically did is it said that you don't really even need a fire chief because the labor contract of the city of Omaha tells you everything you need to do, what you need to have in staff, what you need to have in equipment. All you need is an administrator to administrate the labor contract. So we started looking at that, and most of you probably know we started squawking about it. And um, we, uh, we held press conferences, uh, we did research reports, 
Um, we, uh, uh, if you go to omahaalliance.com, you can see all the work that we've done. And frankly, I think we're the only group in this area that's done the research on labor contracts to see whether or not they're competitive. The mayor hasn't done it. The city council has not done it. So how can you sign off on a labor contract when you haven't done your due diligence to determine whether it's fair and whether it's competitive with, well, with other cities? So then we thought, well, we can't find labor contracts in the Midwest that have all the mandates that this does. So we went to Los Angeles, Providence, Rhode Island, San Francisco, and New York City. Look how thick New York's contract is compared to ours. None of those cities had this either. And I became convinced that Omaha has the worst labor contracts for police and fire in the United States of America. The worst. So, our pension plan's too rich, uh, allows people to retire at age 45. The old contract allowed 45, and uh, uh, top payout is 75% of pay. Now, it didn't used to be that way. In 2003, the early retirement was age 50, and the, your, your, your payout was 55%. And Mayor Fahey wanted to keep the budget uh, tight and didn't want to have any staff raises, so he went to the fire department and said, by golly, let's, let's freeze your salaries for two years. And they said, you want to freeze our salaries? Well, if you're going to do that, then we want something in return. So they dropped the retirement age to 45 and increased the payout to 75%. And if any of you have, would take the time to do it, go to the Platt Institute website and look at their report on the labor contract of the city of Omaha to other cities. You will not find anybody that allows a person to retire at 45 and has a payout of 75%. So, I'm going to make this pretty simple. By the way, this is the new labor contract that the mayor is proposing. Not a lot different. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, we're just going to need to make room. Go ahead and, go ahead and get that first pile out. So we're going to do a little display. What's this all mean? Just go fast. Let's just put them up there. Now, before you rush the stage, these are Bill Clinton $3 bills. I've been holding on to them a long time, just waiting for the opportunity to use these. Do you know what this pile represents? This represents the pile of money that's required to pay the retirement pensions for the civilian employees of the city of Omaha. That pile represents the pile of money that's required to provide the pension for the county sheriffs. That pile of money represents the pile of money required to take care of the state patrol. It also represents the pile of money that's required to take care of most firefighters and most police officers in the Midwest. Are you with me? Okay. Vanna here is going to show you a different pile. Yep. We haven't fun yet? That pile is the pile of money it takes to take care of the Omaha firefighter and the Omaha police officer. What's the difference? The difference is in the labor contract. 
And here, here's the part that really speaks to me. That stack represents the amount of money that you, the taxpayers, have to pay on an annual basis to fund the pensions of civilian employees and county sheriffs and state patrols. It's about 10% of salary. That's it, 10% of salary. That stack, and I'm not joking, this stack represents the amount of money you have to pay every year into the police and the firefighter pension plan for the employees in the city of Omaha. Do you see a problem? 33% of salary is what the mayor is suggesting. Now there's one way to move this down to this. And that is to have to require a smaller pile of money to pay out the pension. And that means you do things like you change the retirement age back to 50, you drop the payout back down to 65% of pay instead of 75% of pay that it is now, so you got less money going out the back end, so you don't need to put too much in. How do you think you would feel if you were a civilian employee and you watched the unions from the police and the fire department work like crazy to elect city council members and work like crazy to elect mayors. And then those unions would push, push, push more, more, more to the point where it now requires this kind of money to take care of their pension instead of this kind of money. Now, one other, one other point I want to make here. How much do you get from your employer to put into your pension fund. If you're lucky, that's what you get to put in. Can everybody see that? If you're lucky, if your employer's even making money right now, 3% of pay is about all that you're getting into your retirement account that just shrunk. But the unions are saying, we don't care. We want you to pay this into our pension plan so that we can have this pile of money so we can retire. Because we were wise, we got involved in politics, we got our candidates elected, they gave us the labor contracts that we wanted, now the city has a liability to pay us this kind of money. So folks, you could have done the same thing. You could have got your people elected. You could have got active in politics. You could have worked hard to get people into office. It would have said no to us, but you didn't do it. So I didn't do it. I wasn't even aware of what was going on back when I started looking at that. So now we're in a situation where the mayor is suggesting that it's okay to pay 33% of salary into a pension fund. Who in this audience thinks that's a good idea? What if it is 40%. What if it's 50%? I mean, at what point in time does the difference between even what you're doing for other employees in the city become so astronomically high that you absolutely can't accept it? Well, that's where, we're, where we are right now. And what the Omaha Alliance has done is we've done a complete study of a labor contract uh, for the firefighters. And next Tuesday at the city council hearing, we're asking all of you to get together and come down to that meeting and let that city council know that they have got to redesign that labor contract because this scenario is not right. Would you all agree with that? Okay, a couple other things. This new labor contract has a bunch of trick language in it. Remember when I told you earlier that the devil's in the details? And when we started looking at that contract, we saw staffing language and mandates that we couldn't find in any other city in America. Well, because we've been squawking, and because the Commission for Industrial Relations made it clear that staffing, rank, and equipment and service is a management prerogative, which means the mayor and the chief and whoever the new mayor and the new chief might be down the road, they can make decisions on staffing. Because 
That came out. They took that mandating and equipment staffing language out of the contract. And they said in this new contract, staffing, rank, equipment and service is no longer a mandate in the agreement. However, you cannot lay off anybody except through attrition. You can't change rank except through attrition. You must hire 24 and train 24 paramedics every year whether you need it or not. Um, and they've got language in there that basically says this. Everybody say moo. Come on, one more time. Moo. Okay, what MOO stands for is Memoranda of Understandings, M-O-U. And what that labor, labor agreement says is any time in the future, the fire chief and the mayor can issue a Memoranda of Understanding, and once they do, it becomes part of the contract. So what is the city council really voting on? It's a blank document. Whatever is in here now can be modified by the chief and by the mayor at will and it becomes a part of the contract. Now who in their right mind would sign a contract like that? Yet our mayor is saying this is a great contract that saves us a lot of money. We've got to pass it. Ben Gray says I'm not going to be a party of no. They haven't done any of the due diligence that we've talked about to determine whether or not this labor contract is fair and competitive with other cities. And they're willing to put language in here that allows two individuals to change the contract at will. Now, should we trust the mayor of the city of Omaha when it comes to this labor agreement and the fire department? We already know that the state auditor came in and audited the books of the fire department and they found it in such a mess that the auditor could not even audit the books and nobody was fired. Nobody. There were employees that the auditor asked to come and, and, and um, account for why they didn't keep their payroll records adequately and they brought their lawyers and refused to ask questions. The mayor could have brought those employees in and if they didn't answer questions he could have fired them. Nobody fired. So that's the mayor. Can we trust the fire chief? The fire chief used to be the union president. He was the person that negotiated these horrible labor contracts that are bankrupting the city now. And we're going to let him draft a memorandum of understanding at any given time to change the contract at will? So can you, can you see, folks, how bad this situation is? It's really, really important that you don't sit it out. How do we get ourselves in this position? I talked about it before. The labor unions work full time, full speed. The union officers do everything they can to get their people elected, and then they ask, 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 ask. And the elected officials are too afraid of the retribution from the unions so they don't stand up to them. They're not afraid of you. Why aren't they afraid of you? Because you haven't shown up. I mean, we just had a recall effort. 10,000 people that signed the recall petition didn't vote. Well, do we, should we care now? All right, that's my point. I want you folks to get engaged. It's time for the private sector to step up and get engaged and not accept this sort of nonsense politics anymore. It's happening here. It's happening nationwide. It's happening in Washington, D.C. And the citizens need to say, enough's enough. We've got to draw a line in the sand, and we've got to say, we want our labor contracts to be responsible, competent, fair, and in the best interest of the greater good of the whole city. And we need to demand more out of our elected officials to negotiate in, in a way that's in the best interest of everybody so that we get labor contracts that are, are reasonable. And the Omaha Alliance 
next Tuesday is going to roll out its recommendations for the new labor contract. And we hope, you be, uh, we hope you're there to be a part of it with us. Go on our website, omahaalliance.com. Look at all the research reports that we've done. Become a member. Help us financially. It's very expensive to do the kind of work that we've been doing. And, you know, that's a great question. Uh, because the normal council meeting's at 2 o'clock. But they're combining two things. The passage of the, of the police management contract and the public hearing on the labor contract. Does anybody know whether we're at 2 or whether we're at 7? 2 o'clock is the fire class contract, 7 o'clock is the city budget. Okay, so 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock is when you want to be there. All right, thanks so much for having me here. OmahaAlliance.com. Hope to see you soon. What I tell you? Would we know half of what we do today without Dave Nabity about these union contracts? I'm going to turn the mic back over to Jeremy Aspen and, uh, and give Dave a, Dave a hand with all this cash. Jeremy?